Welcome back. I taught my first valuation class in 1986. And when I taught that class, I taught it almost entirely with numbers. Why? Because I'm a natural number cruncher. That's what came easily to me. I discovered fairly early in this process, though, that if your valuation is just a collection of numbers, you can move the numbers around and get the value to be whatever you want it to be. And more critically, you can never have enough faith in your valuation to act on those valuations. I discovered fairly early in this process as well that for me to be able to act on a valuation, I needed a story to back the valuation. And that process did not come easily to me. I'm not a natural storyteller, but I've tried to teach myself enough storytelling that my valuations now have stories to them. I've tried to take those lessons I've learned, and some of them I've had to relearn, and try to put them all into my newest book. It's called Narrative and Numbers. It's published by Columbia University Press, and it's available at bookstores near you. I'd like to talk, talk a little bit about the genesis for the book and what I've tried to do in this book. When I walk into a valuation class today, my very first class, I start with a question. What comes more easily to you, storytelling or number crunching? Because increasingly, we're asked to pick, right? Early in life, what we're planning to do with, our, with the rest of our lives. If you're a number cruncher, you're pushed down the number crunching path. You become an engineer, an accountant, an actuary, a banker. If you're a storyteller, you push down the storytelling path. If it's non-business, you could become an artist, a journalist. If it's in business, you become a strategist. And increasingly, I think, we have difficulty talking to each other. We talk different languages. We don't trust each other. The storytellers are convinced that the number crunchers are using numbers to intimidate them. And who can blame them? And the number crunchers are convinced that the storytellers are trying to tell them fairy tales. And who can blame them? I view valuation as a bridge between storytelling and number crunching. What do I mean by that? In a good valuation, every story should have a number attached to it and every number should have a story attached to it. I've tried over the last three decades to become better at building this bridge. I sometimes succeed and I sometimes fail. Now, how do you build that bridge? Now, this book is really about the process I go through to convert a story into, a, into, a, into valuation. And here are the five steps that I go through. Why steps? Well, I'm a linear thinker, so I'm not suggesting these are the, this is the only sequence of getting from a story to a, to a value, but this is what's worked for me. The first step to me in evaluation is to tell a story about a company, a story that reflects what the company does, what business it's in, what, what competition it faces. In other words, you need to understand your business before you can tell a story. The second step is to stop and make sure the story passes reality checks. In fact, I ask three questions. Is it possible? That's a pretty weak test. Is it plausible? T a tougher test. And is it probable? An even more difficult test. If my story passes the reality test, then I ask, can I convert my story into numbers? The key to valuation is to take each part of the story and make it a valuation input. Because once you've done that, the valuation step falls out of those valuation inputs in step four. And then comes the most difficult step of all. Once you've completed evaluation, your natural inclination is to present it to people who think just like, like you. People who will pat you on the back and say, great job. I would suggest that you go to people who think least like you. People are most likely to view your evaluation critically and take it apart because you have to keep the feedback loop open to improve your story. That is what I try to do, sometimes successfully, sometimes unsuccessfully, with every company I value. And I try to describe those steps more fully in this book. So I try to use real companies to illustrate the process. Here are my main players. I use Uber, a company that I first valued in June of 2014. And I tell the story and the value that came out of the story in June of 2014. And then I talk about how that story changed and evolved over the next 15 months as new facts came out about the company. I talk about Amazon, a company that I called a field of dreams company, a company that has promised profits and not quite delivered, but manages to stay afloat because it's the ultimate story store. And I talk about how the story you tell about Amazon can make a huge difference in the value that you attach to Amazon, perhaps explaining why there is so much divergence of opinion in the company. I talk about Alibaba, a company that I call my China story, a company that derives its value from, have, from dominating the Chinese market, the online retail market in China. I talk about Ferrari, an automobile company that's more exclusive club than automobile company and how that frames my valuation of the company. 
There are lots of side players that will enter and ex exit as we, do, as we go through the book. I talk about Vale, for instance, to illustrate how a story can be driven by macro inputs. Because Vale's value as a company is determined less by what the company does and more by what happens to iron ore prices, how Brazil changes as a country, and what the Brazilian Riai does as a currency. I talk about Yahoo and IBM as stories that change as the life cycle of a company evolves. And I also talk about Facebook, a company that I watch since its IPO, and a company where I watch as the story has expanded, the value has changed for the company. In this process, I will focus on these companies as an investor, but I will also spend some time in the book talking about managers and what, what, what I view as their job at companies. In fact, I will frame a manager's job based on where a company is on the life cycle and based on this balance between narrative and numbers. I will argue that early in a company's life cycle, it is, a, it is the top manager, the CEO's job, to deliver a story about the company, a gripping story, a broad story that drives the value of the company. And as the company ages, the story recedes to the background and the numbers start to take over. So the kinds of skills you will need as a manager will shift as a company goes from being a startup to a mature or even a declining company. So as, I, as you read through this book, I hope you will be able to take something away from this book that you can use no matter what your perspective is as an investor, as a manager, or just as an onlooker. Now, three very, uh, very specific things about this book that make it different from my other books. The first is the first of my books where I've used the I and the me all the way through the book rather than the you and the we, the more formal way of writing a book, because this is a personal book. It's a book about my journey from being a pure number cruncher to somebody who incorporates stories in my valuations. I am by no means balanced or perfect yet, but I will keep working on it. It's, it's, it's about my stories for Uber and Ferrari and Alibaba and Amazon, not because they're the right stories, but that because they're my stories. And I welcome you to disagree with my stories and come up with your own. And I hope this book will give you the tools to convert your stories into value. It is an applied book. It's an applied book in the sense that I talk constantly about real companies. That'll make me wrong in hindsight, but it's, it's something that I welcome because I think that the companies I use are companies that most of you should be familiar with. Uber and Amazon and Ferrari and Alibaba. And I want you to tell your stories about these companies. It is a live book because these companies are dynamic. They're changing companies and they change. My story will change. And I plan to revisit them and revisit my story and revisit my valuations over time and post it both on my blog and on the website for this book. In closing, I hope you buy this book and I hope you enjoy it. That is my, my first priority. I hope you get tools out of this book that will make your valuations better. That's even better. And if you find things in this book you disagree with, I'm going to listen to my own advice and keep the feedback loop open. Please let me know what I can do better, and I will try to incorporate it into this book. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope to see you with my book.